with that, folks, we move to the very final session in my little pixelated screen grabbed uh, slide there. Let me put it up big so you can see it all. Uh, you've got to put up with the uh, with myself and my two amazing wingmen, Mark and Tim, who've done a fantastic job moderating sessions through the day. Um, but you don't have to listen to my voice anymore, fortunately for you, because you've got the wondrous voices. Voices, there you go, Eric. You've got two now. You've got the wondrous voices of Eric to, to no take pressure. us through to the last more informal session. And then do stick around because we're going to open it. Hopefully, uh, once we switch the recording off, we'll open up the mics and uh, perhaps do a little bit of serendipity networking. But for now, Eric, over to you. I was not planning to do any impressions, but now you've you've, give, you've given me the opening. I watched some uh, some Steve Coogan and Rob Bryden over the weekend, actually, so I'm actually well prepared. I don't know how qualified I am, but uh, what a great day! Um, you know, it always astounds me how we, I look at this eight hour plus program, and it's so overwhelming. But every session builds on the last. And it really does turn into an ongoing discussion over the course, course of those eight hours. And, and so I want, uh, Tim, I see you're on camera. I'm not sure if uh, Mark is. And actually, Dom, can you stop the spotlight? Um, that way the audience will see gallery view, which is what I've chosen here as the host. Um, I'm not on spotlight, so I'm not sure what's going there. Uh, nobody's spotlighted. I think if you switch it to gallery. There we go. Gallery. All right. I had switched it, but it switched back. At any rate, Mark, Tim, Dom, terrific job. Let's talk a little bit about some of the themes of the day, as well as perhaps catch some of the questions that lingered in the Q&A that uh, individual speakers didn't get a chance to address. It seems to me that the two big themes today, or, or the two words that came up again and again from 7.50 this morning, my time, until now, are edge and multicast. Are these two ideas whose times have finally come? Um, I, you know, I, I, multicast has been around, or at least talked about in terms a lot longer than uh, than Edge has. Uh, although I guess you could argue that's not true either. I mean, you know, Akamai to 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 describe someone at random has talked about their Edge network for decades now. Um, but in terms that we're addressing today, streaming media did a survey back in the spring. Uh, for the content delivery summit that seemed to indicate that our that the people who took the survey at least weren't quite making the leap to edge compute let's start with edge and maybe tim you could start by addressing that has anything changed in the last six months that makes you think that uh edge is becoming more prevalent than it was perhaps even back in may well i'll answer just from the survey standpoint because as you mentioned you know we we do a number of surveys help me stream and streaming media Two things have happened. Um, one, live has overtaken VOD, which means the old edge scenarios that you're talking about with Akamai were very much about put content out there close to the, the you know, end user and viewer. That's essentially what open caching is doing now. Um, and so the nice thing is that that's been formalized into the industry as something that not just one CDN can use. Uh, and, and it goes to the conversation that happened during the, uh, I think during the CDN panel that Dom was doing where, or maybe the one just after that, where essentially somebody was saying, you know, in the old days, we would litigate each other for these new innovations. Now we're learning how to, to collaborate together. The second part of that is because live has now sort of overtaken VOD, what you need is that ability to do, and this is one of the other words I heard, personalization, you know, localizing of content. If you're pushing a live stream out, it's the same thing to everybody. So what you need the edge compute there to do is localize particular portions of it, whether it's commercial insertions or what Ian was talking about, we're sort of rendering at the end. In fact, as Ian was describing that in the last session, it kept coming to my head, MPEG-4 system, MPEG-4 system, MPEG-4 system, because this was the premise that we all had 16 or 17 years ago of using edge computing all the way down to the consumer to actually render some of the, some of the content. So that's sort of my take. Go on, Mark. You have to unmute, Mark. 
You'll have to unmute, Mark, because your lip reading does uh, I can't lip read. Yeah. Then it doesn't work, of course not. Now, I have an addition on this, uh, which relates to the edge thing that Tim also uh, mentioned, but that is on the capacity side. Uh, there has been a lot of talks about capacity, capacity, capacity on diff in, different, in different sessions. Um, but also, again, this relates to what Tim said, moving it more to the edge, the delivery there. But the problem is actually the capacity area. So we're moving to the edge because of the capacity. So I think that's a drive behind what has happened, uh, at least one of the trends, uh, that the increasing capacity and also the, the people being afraid we cannot handle it over time has pushed us more to the edge. Plus, I think in general, CDNs in general, but also other players are just making edge more available. It's much easier now to get edge compute at all kinds of different providers, where if they could take a year back from now, it was not as common yet. And I'll add before Dom mentions something that, Mark, I think you're absolutely right. As live becomes more dominant, there are more and more capacity concerns because as Xavier was talking about in right now in Italy, the only way to watch, you know, La Liga, the premier stuff there is to watch it through the zone subscription. If you're used to having massive scale on television when a when a big game comes on and the CDNs aren't really ready to handle that, including Telecom Italia, you know, the the um, incumbent, then really you're right. Stuff gets pushed further and further out to the edge just because we want to make sure the core network isn't fully impacted. Yeah, and then actually, if you look at uh, the zone, uh, they had issues in the league actually with delivery. So that, but since you, you're in Europe, you can say. I want, I want to just pick up on the uh, on the edge term, um, just to, with, with my sort of pedants hat on. I think the uh, edge is a funny term, uh, a little bit like OTT. Uh, it's one of those, where exactly is the edge questions. Um, you know, when you look at particularly function as a service uh, is often described as an edge compute technology. Uh, it's not one it's one that can be deployed in what I would consider to be an edge compute environment, but it's very often not. It's very often actually deployed in the cloud, in the center of the network. It's not actually technically topologically at the edge of the network. So people are deploying JavaScriptlets or whatever it, it may be to a centralized computing thing. And it seems to be that that edge is just outside the edge of the uh, origin network, if you'd like making a comparison to a live streaming thing. So uh, it's not necessarily uh, a function which is topologically delivered at the edge of a distributed large computing network. And I think that that can cause some confusion. Uh, obviously, sometimes it is, you know, the CDNs were the first edge computing networks, they, they pioneered it, that's what they did, they ran applications deep in the network that weren't simple routing and switching, they were doing stuff in layer four. Uh, and I, I think as we see, it's one of the reasons why I asked the question about service velocity on the video workflow um, uh, um, panel. You know, what, one of the things that's very important about, it, it, what's important to me at least about uh, edge computing is you're trying to deliver a service which for some typically latency reason, re, region or maybe because of uh, regulatory re issues and so on, it needs to be run deep at the edge of a network, not in the core of the network, and then using the network to, to, to transfer that last mile signal. So I think edge still has a little way to go before it really settles down as an understood term. Um, but hey, I've been waiting for people to understand OTT for a decade. Uh, so we, we, it may be some time before edge computing is properly understood. You but but no, if, 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 we're, if we're really going to the edge edge, right, as you say, then where does multicast stay? Ah, I was trying to avoid mentioning the M word because we're going to go down that rabbit hole, aren't we? Um, so um, multicast doesn't really exist as a, 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 a in a, a in a location if it's done properly. Uh, it, it is an end-to-end -end signaling system. It's not something you know. Multicast ABR confuses things because you have a multicast at the back, which then gets transrated or transcoded at the edge to become its ABR formats by some sort of edge computing capability. 
Um, but multicast itself, uh, it, yeah, it's it's it, 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 Eric's been asking some great questions uh, in the Q and A through the day, and I know he's as big a fan of multicast as, as I am. Um, but one of, one of the big problems multicast has is 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 a simple economic challenge. Uh, people are making money out of unicasting, um, and until they're actually bursting at the seams and they cannot get more power to power more fiber terminations to power more. Uh, interconnecting capacity, um, then unicast is a great way to do billing. Uh, multicast is less is less efficient for billing. It's much more efficient for scaling your delivery, but it's it's a co more complex billing issue. Um, some CDNs are smart and they'll bill you for gigabytes delivered. Other CDNs will dive into the saving that multicast will give you to compete with those former CDNs that are billing. Uh, against the multi the, the gigabytes of data data delivered but until we hit that ceiling point where the pipes are full and despite what everybody says about capacity um, I personally don't believe that those pipes are anywhere near full I think there is more than enough dark fiber that's not lit uh, out there uh, I, I don't believe that the CDNs are under pressure in the way that scarcity breeds demand and price uh, would have you believe I, 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 I think multicast has a commercial challenge not a technical one I think te technically actually many networks do use multicast internally as far as I'm aware um, but uh, in terms of getting the access networks to enable it well they're charging for bytes at the moment and uh, I'm not sure that they really want to make the saving <laughs> Well, that kind of leads me into my next question, which is, and you know, I, I kind of like to use this wrap up to talk about some big picture questions. Are the biggest challenges right now technical or are they more strategic and business oriented? Based on the wording I heard, I mean, I, I'm just putting on some, some words I heard, regulation, standardization, interoperability, cooperation. Those are all strategic business minded, uh, but it, they're not technical. Yes, technical needs to be there, but I think a lot of people understand that technical needs to happen, but uh, there's a lot of other stuff that needs to happen as well as part of it. Otherwise, the technical stuff will never move. Yes, I, I tend to agree with Mark. I think the technical challenges are, if not solved, they're at least very directly no. addressable. Yeah, um, they're not. Uh, and, uh, so I... I, I I think um, the technology challenges definitely are waiting for the commercial drivers to 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 force them to the fore. You know, um, um, the four of us have joked many times about why is everyone trying to solve low latency? Didn't we have that solved with like Flash a decade ago, fifteen years ago? Um, and we 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 did, but we had the commercial issue that HTTP delivery was much 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 cheaper to scale, uh, and uh, so I think we've. Uh, you know, we um, we have to wait for those te those commercial drivers to really allow us to bring the technologies to the fore. Uh, I was having a conversation the other day about latency, uh, specifically about latency. You know, what, what people talk about latency as if we've got to set a standard of time. You know, it's got to be three seconds, or it's got to be a second, or it, there isn't a standard. Uh, there is a use case. You can have one frame latency. Uh, okay. across a network it will just be crap quality and if you want to if your kpi is low latency the example i gave on the panel we we did the other day was um some great streaming tech i saw used to monitor the labeling of um i don't know if it was coke bottles but bottles in factories and they're monitoring you know five thousand images a second coming from uh, the labels being printed on the bottles and they react fast enough to take mislabeled bottles out of a pipeline just a few microseconds later. So if you want to do ultra, ultra, ultra low latency, it's absolutely possible in IP. But these images are not something that you could sit and watch on TV. They're very, very low, for low quality, low resolution images. They're just perfectly suited for their application and their use case. And I think that um, with so many of these things we have, with so many of these things, we have a, a sliding scale and it's matched by the use case rather than being technical challenges. So I think the technical challenges, we've had most of them solved. I, I think piracy, possibly not. Um, I think part of the piracy challenge, 
even with forensic finger fingerprinting, there's still the issue of actually finding the pirate content and policing it back to it, it, its owner. Um, that that that's not solved, no matter how how uh, excited people are about the fact that you can do forensic watermarking. We've done it in ideas since 2013. We did some uh, work with BT years ago doing forensic watermarking and so on. The problem is you find the content, have you got an army of people harvesting content off peer-to-peer -peer networks or whatever it may be, who can actually act on that? And that's a commercial challenge, less than a technical challenge. So Dom, to your point about latency not being a, a set number, this, came out of our most recent state of streaming uh, survey, we asked people what their glass-to-glass -glass latency expectation was. And what's really interesting here is it's not a majority of people saying under a second. It's people saying two to three seconds, which essentially is what the dump is on a standard broadcast as well so i i think you're right even being, with, being, being, being tricky about it when you say expectation what do you mean there what we're expecting sorry no pun what what we were hoping for is what people felt was an acceptable level of latency for content being delivered now granted this is live stream ott as opposed to zoom because if we did zoom at two to three seconds all of us would go mad and for you know, first three minutes of conversation. But but what was interesting in this was just to say, look, the, the expectation that someone has on low latency doesn't necessarily correlate always to sub 500 millisecond. I worked in video conferencing before I moved into streaming. And besides interop issues, the latencies below 120 milliseconds were, you know, were absolutely what we had to hit as a standard. And that's the ITU's real-time stream, real-time um, uh, marker point, isn't it? 120 milliseconds. So for me, real-time streaming, low-latency streaming was 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 120 milliseconds. I was always shocked when everyone was talking about, well, three to eight seconds. Just I, I've never been much of a, a, a big HLS chunked person. I sort of skipped that generation of video. And uh, yes, it's nice to watch it on Netflix, but um, yeah, that, that, that wasn't the point of CDN. CDNs were all about taking microseconds out of your delivery time, not seconds. If you're taking seconds out, you're getting something wrong in my books. But hey, and, and I, <laughs> that's my I will, expectation. Uh, to Eric's question about business versus technical, <clears throat> I think interoperability is absolutely a technical issue, but we have to have the business will to be willing to interoperate with each other once those decisions are made, we're going to have another stage where we're having to sort of iron out the issues. And again, Eric Klein's presentation around open caching, essentially saying, look, here's what, here's what we want everybody in the industry to be able to do easily. That's an interop conversation that happens because the business decisions were made to actually figure out how to have consistency across the board. One of the challenges with that interrupt, though, is it, which, Mark, you'll remember with the early CDN Federation that we tried in oh, 2007, yeah. 2008, was, was, was billing records. Well, the, the, problem, the problem was, and I think this is a good one, CDNI and ICDN from Etsy at the time, which years back, uh, never made it work uh, because it was purely based on the technical standard trying to solve a technical issue. They were not solving the business issue because uh, I worked at a company at that time. We actually did a calculation commercially whether it would make sense to do CNNI at that point. And commercially, it didn't make sense. No. So no. If, it, if it doesn't have any commercial sense, and this is go back to your earlier question, your earlier statement, if it doesn't have a business uh, relevance, it will not have a technical relevance. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not quite sure. Yeah, uh, CDNs have changed, though. There is a definitely, you know, this is mentioned. Well, there is a change. There is a change happening. I mean, if, if, uh, um, uh, especially with all the, all the talks that I did as part of the CDN Alliance, uh, you know things are moving. There is movement in the space. Uh, where it exactly is going, I don't think everybody knows, but that there is movement, uh, there is. And actually, I think a lot of people are happy that things are finally moving because I think a lot of people were a little bit stuck in the CDN space. So Eric, one other term I heard uh, multiple times throughout the day, and maybe it's just my ears perk up on it, given Help Me Streams, you know, charitable mission around working with 
emerging economies and putting streaming into places that there aren't streaming is working to the edge of the network, meaning people who have intermittent connectivity. Steve Miller Jones talked about it with his company. Um, obviously, Ian talked about it just briefly with the Orkney Islands. And there were other ones talking about Africa. You know, I, I think that the learnings that we've gained in the first world for CDNs, the question is, will we also transfer those over into these emerging economies? It, even if we feel like there's some level of competition against these local CDNs. And Mark, this will be something I'm really interested to watch with CDN Alliance as you all go to work with CDNs in Lagos, Nigeria, where I've worked, or your parts of The funny thing, we've already, already, we already seen this. There is a trend of what we call localization. So mm -hmm. we have such mass now that for local economies, for local countries, it makes sense to build a CDN local because the big CDNs are not good enough to deliver it there yet. So uh, there are all, there, uh, this is already happening in, in Southeast Asia. You already see this, you have the CDNs in Vietnam, Indonesia, Philippines. They're all local CDNs, um, focus on the local market. They understand the local market, they understand the local connectivity, all the different ISPs that are there, which is much more complex than we have here in Europe and the US. Um, and uh, that is popping up. And that also means that there's gonna be a lot more fragmentation on how things are, how traffic is moving around the globe. Yeah. I'm anticipating, uh, just as a general, sorry, gen general comment, you were talking about regionalization there. I am anticipating a bit of a doubling down on trying to get Africa online over the next couple of years. It's, it's already it's happening, to... right? Limelight is already investing heavily in North Africa in, in building pops out there. And yet what was fascinating was Fastly was saying, hey, we're being asked to build pops. We're having to do, but do, he didn't say due diligence, but ultimately due diligence. Zenlayer, when they showed their map right at the very beginning of the day, real nice coverage in Asia, South America, et cetera. Two points of presence in Africa, one in Lagos, which there are three, I guess. three CDNs there, and then one down in Joburg or Cape Town. So... Yeah. Yeah, in the same is true if you look at Akamai's map and others. I know there's investment being made in those markets. Those markets are so different to do business in, though, compared to you know what we look at in Europe and the U.S. That the, you could spend a ton of money in those places, and within 30 days, not really have a functional system. So I, I, I think. Spending money is good. It'll be interesting to see if they've done their due diligence as, as they're doing the build outs. Yeah, but also curious whether it, whether it changes the tick issue, right? Because because there's no CDN, there is no capability to do real proper streaming to, to people. So it doesn't really take off. Uh, so maybe that will crack the first signs of the chicken egg issue. But what's yeah, interesting? Right? Sorry, Tim. No, let me just say real quick, Dom. So somebody mentioned earlier in the day that the mobile banking systems in Africa leapfrogged the ones mm -hmm. in the U.S. I've worked with um, a number of groups in West Africa that are looking at, you know, micro loans and that kind of thing. And absolutely, everybody's doing banking on their mobile devices because they don't have a computer sitting at home. And I think the same is also true from a delivery standpoint, we may find it being very much a wireless first delivery model with something like EMBMS um, versus a traditional CDN, just because so many people are on mobile devices to consume the content. I mean, just to, just talking a little bit um, hypothetically, because I, to be honest, it's it's more picking things up by gut reaction than 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 having done the research. But we're working with a, 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 an Africa-based content provider group at the moment. Uh, they're building data center. They're building telecoms interfaces with, with with various networks. But the whole thing's highlighted to me that I think I think what's happened over the last sort of five years is that there was a large amount of infrastructure going in to Africa. There was an awful lot of Chinese funding um, to drive that. I think that was that was led by Huawei. 
And I think that the complications that Huawei's faced globally uh, has meant that there's been some stagnation in the deployment of that telecoms infrastructure. And of course, until there's a telecoms infrastructure, there's no IP. And until there's until there's IP, there's no CDN. And until there's, you know, it, 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 it's an and, and, and sequence of, uh, of things which are delaying rollout. But I think it's an inexorable progress. I think it is coming online. There are um, many hundreds of millions of users who are uh, already demanding quite staggering numbers of sort of uh, uh, subscription, if you like, from, from, from local services. But I just think that the infrastructure is, is waiting for the bottom line dollar to dig and duck the telecoms before you can actually deliver wireless or anything on top of that. But I'm, I'm talking from gut knowledge rather than doing well, and, research. And economically, Dom, having done um, Fortune 10 company models around the world, ARPU is a huge thing, average revenue per user. So there's that demand for it, but it's the same model as in India. If I'm going to watch a cricket match, but I can only afford to top up, you know, a couple of gigs worth of data on my phone, at some point, Will we push the price down of the content that's being delivered? Will, will the premium content providers be willing to do that to establish a market in, in Africa and then raise the prices slowly after that? I think that's a huge unknown at this point. Hmm. Another word that came up several times today was regulation. It came up around sustainability. It came up in the Q&A. And I have to thank, uh, we have to thank Indra Klein for continuously putting absolutely pointed and spot on questions in the Q&A, along with Eric Hertz, an AVI trainer. Uh, we appreciate your input. Um, uh, Indra wondered about regulation around piracy, but then if, uh, also I think it was Andy um, who talked about uh, regulation around bandwidth thr throttling. You know, it's certainly, you know, and of course the CDNA and Greening of Streaming both came out and said that you know, you're, you're aware of the specter of regulation uh, in the distance. And so why not get ahead of it and be proactive? And I guess, you know, just by using that term, the specter of regulation, I put a negative spin on it, but it doesn't have to be a negative necessarily if as, and I think this was Elsa who was talking about, there needs to be guardrails. There needs to be standards in the loose sense of the term, um, where do you think our industry as a whole is headed in terms of regulation and what can we in the industry do to influence and impact and guide that regulation so that it's not something like these misguided attempts at net neutrality when no one knows, can even agree on what the definition of net neutrality is? I'm going to dive in straight off the bat with one comment there. And I think Mark's probably going to have a much more salient um, sort of follow up to it, but um, what, one of the things that, we, that that's underpinned the strategy in greening of streaming is to go out, take a step ahead, get a hold of the regulatory issues as an industry and present a consolidated voice for the industry to potential regulators. One of the things that's gone wrong with a number of industries, uh, actually the IT industry as a whole, I think has been pretty good about this, but many industries tend to have a habit of going, we're just going to ignore the regulation until it's forced on us. It's going to be someone else's problem. They're going to come and tell us how our industry should be regulated. And we're going to act like the financial services industry and keep trying to sidestep the issue and find another gray loophole and trying to, everyone's trying to game the regulatory system. What I'm quite pleased about is certainly from greening of streaming and from what I know from the CDNA's point of view, we're actually taking a bit of a proactive look as an industry to try to say, we're, we want to self-regulate. We want to self-regulate substantively so that you don't need to put regulation on us so that we can remain flexible within the framework that is the reality of our industry while at the same time being accountable where we need to be accountable. So I'm hoping that certainly from the sustainability part with greening of streaming and perhaps Mark can fill us in a little bit more about the broader CDN picture, that as an industry, we're, we're, we've learned from the internet service providers who are almost entirely self-regulated, um, with perhaps a little bit of an exception from the ITU. Um, I think that as an industry, we are at least moving in the right direction to, to take some of this responsibility on proactively ourselves to, to, to find a position. But 
I don't know. Mark, what's your take on that? Yeah, so I mean, let's go back to the question, is regulation always bad? Because it's always, it sounds negative, right? Regulation. But uh, it also gives you a lot of capabilities, right? If it's regulation, you need to have things like certification. You need to have like things like training and all kinds of stuff. Um, it just makes the, the market, um, uh, there are lots of other stuff that you can basically sell one side because of you being regulated. Um, so I don't think it's always a bad thing. I mean, regulation could also mean, um, and I'm looking, for instance, if you look at, uh, I had a question with one of the public broadcasters actually, where they said, yeah, hey, uh, we're, uh, the good example of the zone for sports, you can only watch it online. Well, what if a public broadcaster decides, hey, we want to go only online? But then you need to have some sort of regulation on, hey, but every consumer in a country should be able to watch it. So how are you going to regulate this? So, and if we know it's all going into the direction, it's just a matter of time before we come there. Um, but is it bad? Not necessarily, because if it's regulated, it's proven, right? It's, it's uh, agreed upon, let's put it that way. And you could think like, okay, we need to have it, uh, you need, always need to have like uh, a two or three vendors as part of it, always. Brings in more money because you need to have that covered. So it doesn't always have to be negative. But I fully agree, it's better that the industry itself regulates than a government or governments, which everybody has a different perception on how they want to regulate, does it on their own. Because if every government would want to regulate, they are all regulated differently. And CDN networks in general are not localized, right? They're global. So we want to have that self-regulation ourselves because then we can play a better role than if we need to regulate every, every country has its own regulation and we need to comply with this. And this is already happening, and I mentioned this in my presentation, on the privacy part, right? GDPR, CCPA, and all the other countries, they're already working on their own privacy rules and every CDN needs to comply with every local privacy regulation. And this is gonna be a mess. So, Let's learn from this. Get get into the get into the, the part of the the privacy part, and make sure that we're on time for regulation itself. That we do this on our own and not driven by a governmental regulation body. And what the other really thing, want, sorry, Eric. Oh, the, say, what, yeah. we really, what, we, what we really don't want as an industry is a GDPR. I mean, the worst, one of the worst implementations of regulation I've ever seen. You know, it, it, it's it's almost the inverse of what it should have been. But the problem, uh, the problem is, is we don't have a voice, right? And that's one of the reasons why we said, if you look at what we what we what we mean with represent, is we being the voice and the face of the industry. That's what we want to be. There needs to be a face. It needs to be somebody you can talk to. You need to be a voice so we can express what we want. If there is no face, no voice, how are you ever gonna talk to a governmental body or a regulator in general, if there's nothing, you can't, you can't but, talk. Right, and, and the other so, danger is that without associations like Greening of Streaming, the CDNA to some degree lesser, perhaps the SVA or in a different way, the SVA. Different way, I'm more on a technical you run, side. You run two risks. One is that the folks with the most money will have the voice or the ones who make the most noise and have self-appointed them the voice of the industry will be the ones making the noise, you know, making the noise. And um, Tim, Tim, you, you seem skeptical. No, I was going to, I was going to make a American joke, which is, you know, we solve the problem here in the States by hiring lobbyists at really ungodly amounts of money. But here's the thing. I'd much rather have us as the industry have that voice than a lobbyist have that voice because I, I think fundamentally it is one of those things that if we can learn, as you said, Dom, from the IISPs who are essentially self-regulated, if we can learn that, we can grow the markets that need to be grown, including rural areas in the UK, in the US, even- Because in it's beneficial for the industry then, right? So if we, if we help uh, push uh, our knowledge, our expertise towards uh, developing countries. That opens up a market. So that's in the interest of the industry by itself. Right. 
I, I joined my uh, CDN to the Internet Service Providers Association in 2002 or something because I felt that the CDN industry would inevitably come under the uh, under fire from regulators, not least because I think regulators are usually quite tightly involved with governments and governments tend to be quite engaged with their politics and their sort of uh, soundbite driven views and, and so on. And even with, you know, even, even with greening of streaming in this last couple of weeks, just standing up and saying we're and Tim's laughing. Just standing up and saying we're 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 introducing greening of streaming as an industry movement to try to make sure that we take a sensible view on power efficiency within our environment. The bile that was spewed out in some newspapers on the comments feed, who didn't read or didn't even vaguely try to understand what greening of streaming was about, it was an immediate standpoint that we were trying to prevent people streaming, which actually, if you look at the members of our association, would be completely suicidal to be trying to stop people streaming. What we're trying to do is encourage people to stream and be aware of the power consumption and try to help us make better decisions about how to do that more efficiently, not least because it's going to be cheaper. If you use less power, it's going to be cheaper. It's not necessarily a tree hugging um, uh, issue, but neither does it have to be a coal hugging issue. And I, I worry that we see these two sort of poles jumping in on these issues. And if we don't have a voice as an industry, uh, we're not going to be ready to deal with that. We're just going to have views imposed on our industry, regulation imposed on our industry, which has no grounding in reality. Uh, it's just going to be based on visceral politics, which is a real shame. It needs to be based on so, something practical. So let me spend a slightly positive note to that, Dom, you know, coming from the, the right of center. Essentially, you got a bunch of people saying, don't mess with my streaming, which to a certain extent is also a good message back to the politicians, which is don't try to make it harder for me or more expensive for me to stream. We're coming at it in greening of streaming from we're going to make it better to stream. But when you have the when you have the average populace hammering down on the stories that you know are in the Guardian and the Telegraph and saying you're not going to take my streaming away from me, it tells you that we've we in the streaming world have won the argument as to where it's going to you know where innovation is going to occur. And I think Peter summed it up nicely. A couple of years ago, we were saying, oh, if we could get to the equivalent of broadcast, we're way past that now. And so we are the delivery mechanism, which obviously means it comes with some scrutiny. So. There's nothing more vicious than a fight between two libertarians with opposite views. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can have my remote when you pry my cold, dead fingers off it. Uh, <laughs> I think we're just about wrapping up here. Were there any other uh, topics that uh, that the three of our moderators or anyone who is still watching and listening wants yeah, to address? Yeah, there was a lot of comment. There was a lot of comment on the regulation yeah. part on the, on the chat. <laughs> There's a nice, um, sorry, there's a nice uh, question just at the bottom of, of the Q&A um, from an anonymous attendee, which was, uh, what do you see as the biggest final hurdle to widespread high demand internet access? And if 5G represents the best hope, according to some, how is that kind of transition expected in places where 3G still makes up a big part of the last mile, even when there's a large business, government or education fibre infrastructure? So, um, you know, I, I was careful not to do to, to sort of dive too deeply into 5G. Um, I, I struggle to see what 5G is going to bring to the streaming industry, certainly from a one to many media and entertainment point of view. I struggle to see that it's going to bring a great deal to my mobile phone, which has got a sort of six inch or maybe I've got an old phone. So maybe a four and a half inch uh, diagonal um, image. I, I, I get more than enough bandwidth on my phone. Uh, I have problems with where I get that bandwidth and in the Outer Hebrides and in, you know, in, in backwaters, ubiquity is much more of a challenge. Uh, Tim's got both of my phones there. That's where my big phone was. Um, but but I, I, you know, I, I think um, the, the, the issue is not speed. The issue is ubiquity. I think we, we don't need 60 megabit, megabit. We need 20 megabit. Uh, we need to stop pushing the number just because it's a bigger number. Like we need to stop pushing 8K into the home as a domestic TV viewing thing. That's just creating churn of elect consumer electronics, creating waste. It's pointless. It's just Emperor's New Clothes being sold to the consumer. Much the same as 5G as a streaming proposition. 5G has 
other things it can do machine to machine business to business it's going to open up many many new 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 lines of, of revenue and so on but for pure streaming i don't know e ethernet 5g they're kind of you know they're, they're, they're available the issue is i can't get them uh everywhere and i think it would be much better if we invested much more into 4g and got the ubiquity into I, 4G. I think i think 5g is ultimately going to widen the digital divide because you need more more towers for it it means yeah. all some areas are going to get it in the rural areas that don't even have above a megabit a second or a mega and a half a second are not going to get that. Now, I do think HBB TV and ATSC3 have yeah. some really interesting possibilities because low frequency, long distances, the ability to do multicast, that kind of thing. I, I, I think that's a whole nother part of the conversation that we really didn't have that today, but ultimately 5G is gonna exacerbate the digital divide in my mind. And Eric, since you mentioned <clears throat> remotes, the th <laughs> I've noticed people for some reason as they're donating old computers are also throwing in remotes for TVs that haven't existed for 10 years. So <laughs> That's the problem when you offer to take people's old electronic devices. Yeah, I, I didn't ever think remotes would be part of the donation scheme as people donate to us. So. Right, they're just looking to get rid of everything that's in that box rather than pay the, uh, you know, the biannual uh, electronics collection in their town to, to take right. it away from them. I think, sorry, just one last thing. AVI trainers just dropped a good question into Q&A and, and it, it came up earlier in the day. Net neutrality is going to rear its head again. I think the whole um, uh, SK Telecom um, thing with yeah. uh, Netflix has brought that up again um and i think the uh the the there's often a lack of um awareness about the itu's moves to to try to drive this debate um the itu have for many years tried to drive uh, information services back under telecoms regulation uh which they farmed out uh in 1988 which is what created the internet if you sort of go into the macroeconomics of it um, and uh, there is an attempt to drive information services back into telecoms regulation. And one of the ways to do that is to explode the net neutrality debate and try to make out that, you know, YouTube and Netflix should be basically paying to build uh, Africa's internet because, hey, people want to watch YouTube and Netflix. Well, that might be the case. I, I, I tend to sit, sit on the other side of the fence, if I'm really honest. I tend to think that the ISP makes quite a lot of money out of having lots of subscribers and the value proposition to their subscribers is access to OTT content in the true form of OTT uh, as it should be used. So um, I, I think that I think it's good that that debate comes up every now and then because it is uh, it is confusing for the consumer um, as to what's happening. But I personally don't think that um, content providers should be paying ISPs for access to their audiences because they're not private telecoms networks. They are public IP networks, and that's what they're selling as their service in the first place. So either sell it or don't, but you can't be cherry picking the content. So I have an interesting um, counter to that, Dom. When we talked, the very first session was subsea cables. And what we heard two people say there was Facebook and Google are absolutely driving the infrastructure build out of subsea to the, to the volume of billions of dollars. What if they don't allow Netflix to ride on their pipe? What if, you know, it, 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 there's an interesting question as we start getting into the very, very large companies, you know, will Apple ride on a Google pipe? Will some other social network that's up and coming be allowed to ride on the pipe that Facebook built out? I'm not saying that that's, you know, that's a case now, but I think we could actually get to the point where it's essentially every one of the, the top 10 companies builds their own fiber across the, across the pond and then it owns that as essentially a private network, which means even though we're seeing all this innovation, it's only innovation to the benefit of the top 10, 15 companies. Well, well look, that's look, kind look. of interesting. First time I've I'll, ever I'll thought that the, uh, Google and Fiber, the Google and Facebook and uh, Microsoft and um, uh, Amazon Fibers were used by any other parties. I thought that they were purely rolled out because 19 billion across the ocean was cheaper than buying an IRUF lumen. 
Well, I thought, I, it was a, I thought it was a private connection. If there is any other traffic going over there, that's just, oh, well, somebody can buy an IRU on this fiber because we've got some surplus capacity. What I'm saying is I think there could be a regulatory model that would say that there's must carry. Um, and if that's the case, then, you know, you essentially lower the barrier to entry for other up and coming companies in those in those same spaces because the pipe's already there. Oh, we as governments on either end of the pipe can say, yeah, you have to carry this stuff just like public broadcast here in the States for cable television networks. Yeah, but interestingly, Maybe. because it's typically international focused. So that will be an interesting one because one country can say one and the other countries and I don't care. And then what? <laughs> yeah. Well, there's also quite often an asymmetry to to uh, a lot of the pipes. You know, there's a lot of data pulled out of the U.S. into the into Northern Europe, but there's less going from Northern Europe to to, to the U.S. So, uh, I think it depends where the content's originating and what 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 content's being marketed and to who and so on. So, yeah. All right. Well, we're coming up on what time is it for you, Dom? It's uh, eleven o'clock almost. Uh, Mark, it's so coming up on midnight, right? Although yeah. evidently daylight savings time or the end of uh, daylight savings time in the Netherlands means the light never changes because you've had the same light behind you all day long. It's been oh. noon all day. <laughs> midnight, all of Mark's windows go red. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll show you the IBC, Adam. Oh, perfect. You can show me what you like at IBC. What goes to IBC stays at IBC. <laughs> <laughs> and if you catch COVID while you're at IBC, you stay at IBC for two oh, weeks. Uh, yeah, two. <laughs> Absolutely awesome. So, Eric, should we uh, should we see if we want to open up the floor a little bit for uh, 10 minutes to see if anyone from the, um, uh, the attendees sure. wants to... Wants to throw mud at all of us. Should we stop? The so recording anyone for... who's a panelist can turn their camera on. Uh, I will see what I can do here. Do I have to manually turn on everyone's camera? I do, don't I? Why don't I do this just to sort of flag an end point on the uh, recording and then hit stop recording? <laughs>